have uh, people going home to deliver care and many of the elders uh, obviously have found that very uh, useful during the pandemic because mm -hmm. uh, they've been cautious about coming out but they need to be in continued therapy and rehabilitation mm -hmm. so um, uh, and we're now uh, you know as you'll hear from Gayatri we're going digital so mm -hmm. we've, we've got a whole, whole uh, do-it-yourself model as well Oh, that's supported, fantastic. Supported model, yes. That's fantastic. In the call also is Yuvraj, who's uh, who's going to be our. He's our chief physiotherapist. He's going to be our master of ceremonies today. So he'll he'll guide us through the process. Doctor Salpaker and Doctor Even. Yes, nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. We had quite some interest, over 200 registrations, so I hope a, a good proportion will uh, join us to, to listen to what I'm very sure is going to be very exciting. Uh, one of the things I left out in my questions was treatment, so I obviously will, will talk a little bit around that as well um, during the webinar. I think we'll cover everything. Yes, broad <laughs> scope. <laughs> now it'll be fun. It's, uh, it's, it's nice to have some time to, to, to carve out to actually talk about you know, the overlap and, and uh, some heady intellectual stuff. Also of practical relevance because uh, so many people uh, get concerned about the interface, uh, including questions about silent seizures and, and all that, so yeah. Sure. Uh, a lot of people are coming in. Good evening. There's actually just a day break here in Chicago, so we'll see the sun come up soon. If there is too nice. much flare at any point, yeah, let me know. It's actually nice to see a real city backdrop rather than, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. a Zoom backdrop <laughs> of a city. So. I, I thought it'd be fun, although I have a little bit of a, a steam uh, pipe that, that's behind me too, so that might right. uh, obscure our view. <laughs> Dr. Rama has joined us. She's a clinical director. Dr. Salpaker, Dr. Even. So it's six thirty. Shall we start, Gautam? We are. We are ready. We can start. Now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yuvraj, please go ahead. Good evening, one and all. Greetings from Buddhi Clinic. I would like to welcome everyone on the occasion of a Buddhi Clinic's 12th year anniversary. So first of all, I request our CEO, Mrs. Gayatri Krishnamurti, to give the welcome address. Thank you, Yuvraj. Uh, good evening, one and all. I, on behalf of Buddhi Clinic, have great pleasure in welcoming our eminent guest faculty for the evening, uh, Professor Jay Salpikar and Professor Joshua Even, both from the Johns Hopkins University. A very warm welcome to all the audience who've joined us today to understand the brain behavior interface. Before we move on to the panel discussion, I'm going to start milestones on this occasion of Buddhi Clinic's 12th anniversary. Buddhi Clinic's social impact initiative, Buddhi Seva, supported by leading corporates and philanthropists, will touch over 200 lives this year.
Next slide, please. So that's the Buddhi app. While many of our services have been made available online during the pandemic, we are now in the process of developing an app-based digital platform, Buddhi Online. Next slide, please. Buddhi Clinic in Coimbatore is now equipped with an OT suite to help restore to our clients the activities of daily living. Howard Gardner's concept of multiple intelligences, often used in corporate training, would now be integrated into the rehabilitation process of Buddhi Clinic, thanks to the guidance of Mrs. Usha, Usha Ramakrishnan. The membership program, our privilege cards offer a range of value added benefits to our esteemed patients to help them with continued care. I'm very happy to now present the Buddhi team and would like to place on record our appreciation for their sincere efforts during these challenging times. Can we have the video, please? The Buddhi voices. As Buddhi Clinic strides into its 13th year, together with our patients, we celebrate the holistic goodness of integrative medicine, which seamlessly blends ancient wisdom with modern medicine. Just as we take care of the brain and the mind, we also focus on lifestyle modifications, sleep hygiene and gut health. We shall continue to strive to improve the quality of life and to offer relief and comfort to all our patients and their families who trust us with their care. Rehabilitation is a medicine which adds life to your days. I enjoy rehabilitating the neurological conditions in Buddhi Clinic by redeeming them from the wheelchair. At Buddhi Clinic, the state-of-art neuromodulation lab paving our way to the new frontiers of neuropsychiatric care which have helped the people around the world to rediscover the color of life. We at Buddhi Clinic offer excellent psychological therapy support alongside neuropsychiatrists and neurosurgeons and also practice a range of therapy techniques like CBT, REBT, etc. with our clients from all age groups. Ayurveda, the ancient medical wisdom under the guidance of modern medicine, helps to restore normal functioning in buddhi and manas for the children, adult and elderly. Relieving pain, renewing hope, restoring function, the name to trust for experienced pain relief center, Buddhi Clinic. Electrophysiology evaluation is very important to diagnose neuropsychiatric conditions. The brainchild of world-renowned neuropsychiatrist, Buddhi Clinic believes that a patient with a pain is a pain is a force. Hire for attitude, train for skills. That's the mantra of Buddhi Clinic. The future of healthcare is hybrid, personalized, yet comprehensive, built on a strong edifice of patient experience, expert knowledge, and empirical research. Innovative, pioneering, and scalable, Buddhi Clinic's integrative therapy paradigm is here to stay. Truly Atmanirbhar in spirit, reflecting a bold, new and confident India. Thank you. Over to you, Raj. Thank you, ma'am. So as we all are eagerly waiting for the clinical conversation on seizures and autism, so it's my immense pleasure to invite the speakers. First, Professor Jay Salpeker, Director of Neuropsychiatry in Epilepsy Program and Attending Medical Staff, Department of Psychiatry, Kennedy Krigger Institute, VSA, full time academic faculty, John Hopkins University, and courtesy consulting medical staff and John Hopkins University, uh, Hospitals. 
He is called Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship at Yale University, and has over seventy-five scientific publications to his credits. I also like to invite Professor Joshua Benjamin Even, Associate Professor of Neurology at John Hopkins University, Associate Professor of Psychological and Brain Sciences, John Hopkins University, and also Craigie School of Arts and Science. Attending physician at pediatric department, both in Johns Hopkins Hospital and in Craig Institute, resident of neurodevelopmental disabilities and child neurology, again John Hopkins Hospital and Kennedy Craig Institute. He has got fellowship in clinical neurophysiology and has over 50 scientific public publications to his credit. I like to invite a Dr. E. S. Krishnamurthy, behavioral neurologist and neuropsychiatrist. Founded at Buddhi Clinic. Over to you, sir. Hello. Um, good evening. Thank you, Yuvraj. And uh, uh, once again, a, a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today. In special, I'd like to welcome both our uh, eminent faculty who have taken time off on a Saturday morning uh, to be with us, uh, Dr. J. Salpeka and Dr. Joshua Even. Um, the webinars that we do and these dialogues that we do are meant to do three things. The, the first, to raise awareness about the importance of the brain and mind uh, to professionals and the wider audience. The second, to get people thinking about difficult questions. And I think today, uh, what we're going to do is talk about some very difficult questions at this interface uh, seizures, autism, neuropsychiatry, and behavior, uh, and the role of the brain uh, in all of this. So that's, that's something that these webinars do. The third is to create a community of people who have the shared common interest in the brain uh, and human behavior. And uh, uh, we do these webinars now six times a year. And I'm very pleased that this webinar, which comes towards the end of 2021, uh, is also marking 12 years of uh, uh, our integrated brain and mind care effort. So it's a very special day, and I'd like to thank both uh, Dr. Salpaker and Dr. Even for to joining us. Um, I'm going to ask questions, and I'm going to let you respond in turn. Uh, I will not be specifying who the question is for, and I, I presume that that's okay with, with both of you. Um, so let me begin by asking... What symptoms should lead one to consider and suspect autism in childhood? And how does one make that diagnosis? Sure. Why don't, uh, why don't I go ahead and start it out and then and I'll turn it over to Dr. Ewan. Uh, but as a, as a preface, uh, Dr. Krishnamurti and, and everybody there, congratulations on 12 years uh, with the Booty Clinic. That it really is a spectacular accomplishment. And it's, it's wonderful, the kind of facility that you have, which I have seen personally and uh, was very impressed and a tremendous service, not just to Chennai, but all of India and truly the world, as I know that I have uh, sent you patients from the U.S. even to receive consultation at Budi Clinic. And I, I'm very impressed and I'm very happy to participate in this webinar and to here already from so many colleagues in India uh, and all over the place. So, so it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm very delighted to have my colleague, Dr. Josh Ewan also here, who's an expert and scientist and uh, will, will help answer these and other questions as well. So uh, anyway, in answer to your question, in terms of the symptoms of autism, the way that I think about it is that it's a triumvirate of sorts. We, we have three main symptom areas that seem to be most prominent. Now, the one, perhaps the most important symptom area has to do with communication. There is some sort of altered communication. It's either a style of vocabulary, manner of speech, interaction. Sometimes it's, a, it's an absence of communication or an absence of verbal communication. So usually communication of some sort is altered. The second main feature is some kind of social relatedness problem. So 
and children and young adults also with autism. They may have pragmatic social difficulties. They might not read social cues, but more importantly, they may not be interested in relating with others socially. So they can avoid it. The social milieu is not a place where they are comfortable and they may revert to isolating themselves and not interacting at all. And then the third main symptom area is some sort of stereotyped interest, activities, behaviors, sometimes even movements. So they might have a very narrow focus of interest. Uh, just as an example, I've had patients, and I know Dr. Ewan does as well, uh, where they, they're only interested in one topic. Maybe it happens to be trains, and trains are very common. We have uh, our patients with autism who will memorize the train schedule to the exclusion of, of any other activity. And it's very difficult to engage them unless it, it is with their preferred interest. But the stereotype can also be transferred over to movement. Sometimes there'll be motor movement, uh, extra wrist, arm, leg movements that can be repetitive or stereotyped in some way. And usually there's that pattern of either movement or interest that is uh, prominent with autism. So I look at it with those three. And I'll, uh, I'll let Dr. Ewan add if uh, he wants to. Thank you. Uh, and, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Christian Worthy for the wonderful invitation and the opportunity to learn about, uh, about the Booty Clinic. This is, this is truly wonderful. Uh, I'll agree with Dr. Salpakar's answer. If I can add just a little bit to it, it's only to say that the presentation may vary a little bit depending on the age that we're considering, depending on the severity level, and also de depending on the family's or cultural expectations. Uh, let me take the, the last one, the last point first. I was giving a talk in France and I, I, I learned something that I didn't previously know because lots of my research has to do with the motor system, the movement abilities in kids with autism. And whereas in the US, as Dr. Salpakar said, it tends to be um, social aloofness, that was the word that was used a long time ago, or uh, issues with language that bring a patient to attention, especially earlier on. In the French system, uh, there's a, a focus on physiotherapy and the motor system, even in relatively small children. And what I learned there was that because of this focus, it may be the motor systems or the motor performance, the physical movements and abilities that bring uh, children to attention before the social or the language. But with regard to severity, we, we of course see some children who don't speak and never learn to speak. And so they come to attention very early on when it would normally be expected that they would be learning to speak. Um, for children who may be a, somewhat less severe, when they get into school, and as Dr. Salpakar says, they have these very specific interests that they want to tell you about uh, over and over again, and the, their classmates are not excited to hear about them necessarily, these, these topics, uh, that may be what brings them to attention in the less severe instances and later in life, in school age. Thank you. If I, if I can draw, draw that further to ask about childhood epilepsy, which sometimes can be quite difficult to diagnose, um, and there could sometimes be an overlap. Uh, how do we uh, you know, go about suspecting epilepsy in those difficult cases? And uh, uh, what, what do we see uh, as characterizing uh, you know, childhood epilepsy that's different from adult epilepsy? Maybe I can start with this one and then turn it over to Dr. Salpakar. Uh, <clears throat> so in instances where there's a convulsion, this is, I think, very clear, and I don't think that there's anyone who would uh, hesitate to understand that that may be a manifestation of epilepsy. And I think that's true with children who are otherwise typically developing. That's true with children who may have a known disability like autism or intellectual disability or cerebral palsy. And that's uh, true for adults as well. Where we get into more subtlety 
is when there are attentional problems in some instances, relatively rare, but, but, but they certainly exist. There may be some instances where we suspect ADHD and then on further questioning, we decide to do an, an EEG because we might suspect absence epilepsy. In the case of somebody who has autism and regression, they were developing normally or close to normally, and then they lost abilities. They lost the ability to speak. They lost their social relatedness and the joy of interacting with other people and became you know, uh, more aloof in, in the old terminology. Uh, we very often do EEGs then because we're concerned about a situation where seizure activity that's in the brain but doesn't manifest as a convulsion uh, may be very responsible for their autistic and language symptoms. So these are the, the, the more subtle cases. And then Dr. Salpar very well pointed out the movements that may be repetitive and occur in uh, very typically in autism, we call them stereotypies. And sometimes it may be difficult to separate out what is a stereotypy versus what is a more subtle seizure, not a full body, both arms and both legs convulsion, but a more subtle seizure that affects just the arms, just the legs, one or the other. That's where questioning EEG and other sorts of things can help us uh, uh, differentiate. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Salpika, would you like to add to that? I think it was well stated. Uh, I'll, I'll say sometimes it can be very difficult because seizures aren't always clear cut. And even on an EEG, if we have, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Ewan talk about that in more detail, but uh, even on an EEG, sometimes it's difficult to interpret exactly what you see and how it correlates with behaviors that you see. Uh, we don't always have the luxury of having a video attached to the EEG so we can, we can see both. Uh, and then sometimes when you have these movements or disrupted attention, it, it may not be a seizure. So it's you know, trying to compare what you see with what the EEG correlate happens to be can be a difficult business sometimes. But I think that we, we do look at movements, change of consciousness, change of awareness, and interruption in activities as sort of our first clues. Thank you. In fact, that's something. Sorry, please go ahead. Oh yes, let me add one point to that. Uh, something that I, I mentioned to families is that four years of undergraduate, four years of medical school, seven years of postgraduate medical education could be boiled down to a pamphlet for many of my visits in the clinic. What I mean is this, that, that if we have children with ADHD, children with autism who have staring spells or may have staring spells that we know are not epilepsy. They may just be drifting in attention, very common in ADHD, for example. Uh, and I'm trying to differentiate that from an absence or a uh, focal seizure that may be causing this change in attention or interruption in, in behavior, uh, that I tell the parents, try to get your child's attention, not just calling his or her name, but pinching or, or something else, uh, obviously not too aggressive, but something else that would certainly get their attention if their brain were functioning typically. And if you consistently cannot get their attention, then that is very concerning for seizures. And if you consistently can get their attention, then that's almost certainly not seizures. And that one piece of information is more useful than an EEG or inpatient EEG or any of these other things, it's much more helpful. And, and as I say, could boil down most of my training in that context, uh, just to this one piece of advice. You've brought me to a very interesting uh, kind of point. Um, many people say that, you know, my child spaces out and I'm talking to him and he's not, uh, or he or she is not answering, uh, you know, to my questions or seems to be ignoring me constantly. Um, how are there other behavioral correlates that help you decide whether this is, uh, you know, am I dealing with silent seizures? Am I dealing with autism? What am I dealing with? Or inattention? I just say pinch them gently. 
This is probably the single most important piece of more important than EEG and all of this technology. Pinch them gently and you will know your answer 99% of the time. So Maybe the child responds to the, uh, to the stimulus, then you know that uh, it's not a seizure. If the child does not respond to that stimulus, then you, you probably should consider this being a seizure. I have to ask another practical question to both of you. So when people give you this history and you say, okay, let's do an EEG, uh, what proportion of uh, children with developmental disabilities have an abnormal EEG anyway? That's one question. And the other question, most of our children end up needing to be sedated in order to have an EEG, uh, which then means you can't correlate even with the video EEG of behavior to the, the, the electrophysiological event. Uh, so any comments on that? Jay, do you want me to answer? I, I don't want uh, to talk please. to you. Please. No, no, okay. no, Dr. Ewan, you are the, the, the expert. <laughs> well, the, the EEG is a little bit my area. So, so, so I apologize if I'm talking too much. Um, right, so, so this is a very, very, very important question. This is a very important question. We know, that uh, uh, children with autism, well, I guess for the audience, let me make two distinct, let me make an important distinction. That is when we capture a spell during an EEG, our certainty in the answer is very great. Either we see activity in the brain that is associated with that seizure or spell right at that moment, or we don't. And that gives us, call it 97% confidence, yes or no. On the other hand, most EEGs are done interrectally, and that means between seizures. Uh, and that gives us a little bit of information. I'd explain to parents this way, that, that if you have a uh, hundred pieces of equipment and one of them has sparks coming out of it, and you say, which one is likely to catch on fire? A fire being our analogy for the seizure, it's the one, of course, that's sparking, but you don't, it may be the case that the sparking machine will never catch on fire and has never caught on fire in the past. And so it's, it's much more limited information. And I could give you lots of statistics about what it means this way or that way. But, but your very important question is that children with autism have probably 20% of them have these sparks in between seizures. And so if we see an EEG with these sparks and Mrs. X says, does my child uh, is he having seizures? We could say that the sparks, these, these characteristics of the EEG, either were there anyway, nothing to do with seizures, but just based on the fact that they have a developmental disability, or we could say that they're associated with the seizures. So it changes our thinking by a little bit, but not by, by very much. When we do sedation, let me say, correct that we often, for sedation, we use dexmedetomidine which unlike some of the other things does not suppress the sharp waves and the spikes. What I'm referring to is as sparks in the EEG. So that helps. We get, for the neurologists in the audience, we get beautiful N2 sleep uh, and we see sharp waves if, if they're there. Uh, so that doesn't hurt the inner EEG, but this only lasts 30 minutes to 90 minutes to two hours. And certainly we can't get a four day epilepsy monitoring unit inpatient EEG where we have the hope of capturing the spells if they are not spells which are occurring on a regular basis. We also are very lucky to, lucky to have behavioral psychologists who will work with the patients to tolerate the EEG. Uh, and so we use sedation very, very rarely, but it may be a delay in getting the EEG because it can sometimes take one visit or it can sometimes take three months worth of visits uh, with our behavioral psychologists before their behavioral abilities are such that they can have the EEG. Thank you. Jay, you've done a lot of work and you've written about behavior and epilepsy and childhood epilepsy in particular. Uh, could you take us through that? Uh, what do we see in childhood epilepsy and how is that different from adult epilepsy? Sure, sure. Well, the, you know, my entire career has been spent in this intersection or this overlap maybe maybe it's a it's a uh, you know a gap between psychiatry and neurology 
And I've gravitated towards studying epilepsy because the overlap has been so significant with all of our brain and behavior relationships. The amount of psychiatric illness overlapping with epilepsy is quite striking and seems to be overrepresented. I'll give a, a little mention of uh, Sir Michael Rudder, who just recently passed away, actually. Uh, but 50 years ago, he produced his uh, Isle of Wight epidemiology study, which found that among children with epilepsy, the psychiatric illness was significantly overrepresented, sometimes two to three times as much as even another uh, chronic medical illness. So there's something different about epilepsy. We see behavioral issues, cognitive problems, mood. There, it just seems to be more than what we see even in other children who've got asthma or diabetes. And I think it's more than just a, the threat of an impending seizure or lifestyle change, as you might see in diabetes. There's something about disrupting brain function that leads to psychiatric illness. Now, it's even more than that for adults. And I think that there's, there's something about plasticity in children that maybe is protective in some ways. They can, they can adapt and adjust. Uh, in adults, the comorbidity may even be higher, but we have less access to them because they don't have a parent or, or a, a school teacher who's noticing a problem and, and helps them to seek clinical attention. But I think it's at least on the order of a third in children who will have some kind of psychiatric illness along with the epilepsy. For adults, it may even be higher. I will say also, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this a lot more, because the comorbidity is so high in epilepsy, I tend to think of this as one illness, that we don't really have seizures plus a psychiatric, quote, comorbidity. But I think that whatever is physiologically wrong is leading to both circumstances, seizures, and then also, let's just say, depression or attention problems or whatever the case may be. Now, that's a huge paradigmatic change from certainly how, how I was trained and, and uh, Dr. Ewan quite sure also. Uh, it's, it's a distinct difference in how we approach things. Now, if we if we have a patient with epilepsy and, and we say we must expect some kind of psychiatric comorbidity and then treat accordingly and likely concomitantly, then we have a, a, a huge stride forward about trying to assess and address this comorbidity that we would not have studying things and, and treating uh, these illnesses the old way. So, so it is a, a new paradigm. And I think that taking into account everything that we see behaviorally, psychiatrically, will actually help inform the epilepsy care. Uh, and the reality is it, it may be vice versa as well. So I'll stop at that point, but uh, hopefully I've answered the question without too much digression.